Welcome back, everybody. So this is our second part. Last time we were discussing the deep intervention issue. So again, a simple example is basically simultaneous subsidies given to firms and workers, right? For new technology and new skills. Um, of course, this is not this is not very straightforward, right? Because there could be many different uh, barriers. Uh, you may think of the political economy constraints, uh, the governance issues. Um, so in general, it is, it is difficult, but there are some examples, of course, in the real world uh, where we see uh, growth miracles, right? So these, these growth miracles usually uh, benefited from such reforms, reform acts. Um, here, of course, cooperation versus competition matters. How? Uh, as you realize, if there are complementarities and if there is a risk of coordination failure, then it is better for the people to cooperate than compete, right? Um, this is like in a prisoner's dilemma, okay? So there are two parties or um, many parties. This, this uh, isn't really important, but more than one player is acting and those actions are affecting the incentives and the payoffs of other, other people, other, other agents. Um, so if they cooperate, as you know, in the prisoner's dilemma, if they cooperate, they can achieve the better, uh, better outcomes, right? The, the important thing is that how to sustain cooperation in such cases, right? Because uh, imagine the society playing such games, playing such coordination games over and over again, okay? So it's not just a one-shot game, right? Uh, in such games, in such repeated, let's say, prisoner's dilemma games, even if you initiate uh, cooperation at some point, then it is difficult to sustain it. Why? Because uh, some players will have some uh, incentive to defect. So there could be some mechanisms or some reasons that support coordination and cooperation. Um, typically, uh, trust plays a large role here because um, if, I, if I trust my opponent, uh, that if I, if I think that, if I expect that he or she will keep cooperating, then I have, of course, the incentive to cooperate. So trust matters. And also uh, what matters is the degree of patience. Okay, so if players are sufficiently patient, uh, are sufficiently uh, long-term oriented, then it is easier to sustain cooperation in such games, okay? So the, the big question, of course, is how to design such mechanisms, all right? In, in case of firms versus workers, how to design a mechanism that make uh, firms to invest in new technology under the expectation that workers will invest in new skills and how to convince workers uh, to invest in new skills under their expectation that firms will, will keep investing in new technology. So um, as you see, um, and there are many other examples that we will discuss, uh, even today we're gonna discuss some of these. So uh, cooperation, so how, how the society uh, cooperate, how the members of a society cooperate to coordinate their actions for better equilibrium. Okay, here is the notion of multiple equilibria. Obviously, I mean, as the name suggests, here it's a situation uh, where uh, basically we have more than one equilibrium, right? Uh, importantly, uh, most of the time we can rank these equilibria, okay? Uh, in terms of, for instance, growth rates, in terms of uh, distributional consequences uh, in terms of suppose profits or welfare, right? Uh, remember Pareto definition, right? In the, in the Pareto definition, if, if, a, if an allocation or equilibrium is Pareto 
efficient, then basically we cannot make at least one peer, one person better off without making at least one person worse off, right? So uh, in that sense, we can rank different Pareto efficient equilibria uh, with respect to the welfare levels associated with each of them. Okay, so suppose that you have three equilibria, uh, one equilibrium uh, among them would be given highest utility to the average agent. Uh, the other give, gives you the lowest utility and the, uh, and the third one gives you a utility level between these two, okay? Uh, one other example would be, uh, uh, you know, equity efficiency trade-off, right? So if you allocate resources more efficiently, then growth would be, let's say, faster, uh, depending on the model you have, of course. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, you may uh, you may want to allocate these resources more equitably. Uh, then you face a lower growth rate. Let's say, okay. So such trade-offs exist in real life. Uh, it depends on uh, your preferences as a society, okay? Um, there is, of course, this famous impossibility theorem by Kenneth Arrow. Uh, Kenneth Arrow in 1951 or 1950, I guess, uh, he showed that the typical uh, properties of consumer preferences, remember those preference uh, properties, right? So continuity is there, independence, uh, transitivity, right? Remember those, those concepts from micro theory? Uh, so Errol showed us in a, in a very nice theorem that uh, those properties cannot coexist to describe social preferences. So social preferences in general do not satisfy all of these uh, properties. Okay, so in that sense, uh, social welfare uh, is a very different concept than individual welfare. Okay. Now, this is a typical example of multiple equilibria. Uh, you must be remembering solo model. In the solo model, there's this production function and there's this fixed saving ratio. Then there's population growth and uh, depreciation rate. So that society always goes to a unique equilibrium, right? Because saving is constant. Uh, in in, pro, in per worker terms, uh, you allocate a fixed fraction of output to, uh, to investment. Then if investment is larger than uh, you know, then the depreciation here, depreciation is basically M plus delta times K. Delta is the rate of depreciation and is the growth rate of workforce. So capital per worker basically goes to a constant, right? But here in this example, we have a different situation. Why? Because here, as you see, saving depends on capital stock, okay? The saving ratio itself depends on capital stock. So it is an extended model. And this extension creates a complementarity, okay? A dynamic complementarity. Why? Because uh, in the law, if, uh, so here we assume that this relationship is positive. So if you have more capital stock, uh, you have more savings. So here you see the threshold level. If you, if you see the cursor, Right here, you have the threshold, okay? Below that threshold, saving is lower, okay? S, S is lower below that threshold. And above that threshold, S is larger. So here's the difference, okay? And as you see, if this is true, if saving ratio depends on capital stock in this way, then we have multiple equilibria, right? There's one steady state here, which eventually corresponds to a low level of capital stock per worker. And there is this high steady state that corresponds to high saving ratio, okay? And in that steady state, capital stock per worker is higher. 
Okay. Um, now, this is a slightly more complicated uh, example. Let me just explain what it is. So here on the uh, vertical axis, we have a privately rational decision. Okay, and here we think of firms and investments. Okay, so there are firms. Each firm is indexed by I. Okay, there are many firms in this economy. And each firm takes a decision on private investment. This decision, this uh, amount of investment is denoted by YI. Okay. Now, on the horizontal axis, we have average investment. Okay, we have average investment. And for some reason, People, these firms, when they take an investment decision, they base these decisions to average investments. So if I if I have a if I'm a firm firm owner, I sit on my office, I sit in my office and decide, you know, I take a decision on how much to invest by looking at what others are doing, what other firms in the same industry is doing, are doing, okay? How much they invest. And I look at the average investment level, which is X, okay? So on the horizontal axis, we have X, the average investment level. And on the vertical axis, we have the privately rational level, okay? And that privately rational level is a function of average. Now, this average uh, affects the private decision of firm I. It affects the investment level YI in a nonlinear way. Okay, why nonlinear? Because uh, if I look at the average and if the average is low, then I invest a low amount. Okay, because I think, okay, if the others are investing at low amounts, maybe there is something wrong with the demand. Maybe uh, I should not uh, I should not invest a lot when they are investing only little. All right. So there is this behavioral dimension in this in this type of thinking. Uh, when average is getting larger, firm increases the investment level. Okay, as you see. Uh, at low levels, yes, the investment is low, but if investment was, if average investment is getting larger, then I realize, okay, I should invest because everybody is investing now, all right? The average is getting larger, so I should benefit from this market share, all right? But then at very large levels, at very large levels of the average, I again decrease the pace of increase, okay? So there is then first a convex and then a concave relationship, All right? And obviously there is this threshold, okay? From convex to concave, this F function changes the uh, derivative at that particular threshold level of investment, all right? Now, how to find equilibrium? That's the question, right? How to find equilibrium? Now, obviously, uh, we're gonna take expectations, right? And then we have uh, three equilibria, as you see, right? Because at the end, average will be equal, right? Equal to the expected value of actual investment levels. So X, the average, must be equal to the expected value of privately rational investment decisions, okay? So then we have three equilibria. One is D1. So the average in this equilibrium is D1, right? Because uh, actual is equal to expected. Since actual is equal to investment, no firm 
will change the behavior, okay? Same is true for D2. Again, the average is equal to actual, right? And then at D3, we also have equilibria because the average is equal to actual, right? So right here, then to solve for the symmetric equilibrium, we solve this equation, right? You look at this equation, X must be equal, X must be equal to the expected value of the actual, obviously, right? Because average here is the expected value. Then this equation must also be satisfied. Why? Because Y is determined in this way. So this is a this is an equation. This is an equation that has one unknown. This unknown is Y star. Okay. So that equation is satisfied again for three different levels, D1, D2, D3. But here is the question. Uh, which one of these are stable? Which one of these are unstable? Okay. And obviously, uh, D1 and D3 are stable. Why? Uh, so first you see uh, in the D1, we have low investment. Okay. And this is consistent with the expectation of low investment. In the latter, we have high investment. And again, this is consistent with uh, actual high investments, right? So obviously from a mathematical point of view, you see that slopes at these points, look at the slopes, slopes of F, right? Slopes are less than one. Right? Here, slopes are less than one. So from a mathematical point of view, these are stable. Now look at D2. D2 is unstable, why? Now suppose this, suppose we deviate to a point that is slightly larger than D2, okay? It is slightly larger than D2. What happens here? Well, in that point, uh, this equation holds, right? The expected value of actual investments is larger than average. So what, what does it mean? They, you know, people believe markets are expanding. Actual is greater than average. So everybody is investing a lot. Investment, actual investment uh, is larger than the average. So what do you expect? So you start, you keep investing, right? Because the average is larger. Uh, sorry, the average is lower than your actual. So you keep investing because now you think expanding market will benefit your firm. So you keep investing, investing. Once you, once you keep investing in that portion, in that, in that region, because of concavity, it increases. And eventually you reach your stable equilibrium. Okay. Think of the other case. If we deviate to the other side, for some reason, actual is less than the average, then what do I realize? Oh, okay, wait, I invest too little, okay? So, I, so my, my actual investment is larger than the market average, okay? So I should decrease it, okay? Because average is larger than my investment, okay? Something is wrong again with my decision because uh, this, has, this, this shouldn't be the case. 
So I then keep decreasing my actual investment until when? Until I find my stable equilibrium, because in that stable equilibrium, uh, my actual is equal to my average, so my stable. Okay. So here, I'm understanding complementarity here. My decision depends on all the other firms' decisions. How? Through the average. I look at the market, okay? If I uh, invest an amount larger than the average, if that uh, expected value is larger, then I realize I should benefit from this investment cycle. I should invest a lot. If it is lower, then I should decrease it because I cannot benefit if uh, if everybody is investing investing uh, at this amount. Okay. So eventually, I I reach at I reach the D one equilibrium. So expected decision by other agents are equal to the privately rational decision. Okay. Now, another example would be the YouTube example. Um, so here, YI is the number of videos YouTuber I uploads to the public domain in a week. Okay. And X would be the average. Okay. X would be the average number of videos YouTubers, all YouTubers, upload to the public domain in one week, okay? Now, think of this. If the average is low, then spending time on YouTube is not really beneficial, right? I mean, it's not really enjoyable. Why? Because the number of videos that you will see is low, okay? So you will keep seeing the same content over and over again because the average is low. Not many people are uploading too many videos, all right? However, at increasing levels of X, more YouTubers can join and add more videos. Why? Well, obviously, if there are more videos to watch, then you spend more time on YouTube, all right? Then you may be uploading more videos of yourselves. You upload more content. Then we see exactly the same graph. Right at low levels, at low levels of average number of videos that you will see, you upload a low level, a low number of videos. At high average, when the average number of videos that you can see is larger or very high, then you spend a high, a large amount of time in YouTube, then you upload more videos. Okay. And once again, exactly in the previous figure, we have two stable equilibria, one with a large number of videos, one with a small number of videos, and in between, we have the threshold, okay? So here is another example. Uh, now we imagine this Y as the interpersonal trust. Okay, so this is a trust game. So each citizen uh, has a level of trust, okay? Trust to others. At zero, there is no trust. At one, there is complete trust, okay? For agent I. And X is the average again, okay? X is the average again. So uh, the relationship is nonlinear, as you see, okay? So people I, citizen I, depends on whether he or she trusts the other people by looking at the average, okay? If average 
is less than a half, okay, if on average, half of the, more than half of the society do not trust people, then our agent does not trust the other people. If the average is larger than 0.5, then slightly more people are trusting each other. So our agent trust, trusts the other agents. So we can draw it. So this is the y equals x line. And this is the f function. The black one is the f function. Okay. The black one is the F function. So the question, so this is actually an exercise. I want you to find the equilibria, find all the equilibria here and discuss the stability of each equilibrium point. You're gonna use this equation, this one, okay? You're gonna find the symmetric equilibrium, all right? Very simple, just think about it. And I will discuss the answer next week. Now, again, in terms of ranking, uh, there could be welfare rankings. Uh, we obviously ask if one of these equilibria is better in terms of uh, Pareto efficiency, okay, or Pareto, Pareto levels. Um, so here's a question. If a government intervenes in, to the economy, and moves the equilibrium from one to the other, does this intervention increase at least one agent's welfare without decreasing the welfare of any other agent? Okay. Uh, the general result is this. In the case of complementarities and externalities, of course, uh, government intervention may uh, move the economy uh, to a better equilibrium, okay? To first best, let's say. As you know, we have different concepts, first best equilibrium, second best equilibrium, third best equilibrium. Uh, in such models with coordination failures, complementarities, externalities, public goods. So here you may imagine that information is, is itself a public good, right? So in such models, government intervention uh, may play a big role in uh, moving the economy into a better equilibrium, all right? So this is uh, very different from uh, the competitive equilibrium, right? Because if there's no market failure, if there is a unique equilibrium, there's nothing the government can do. I mean, there's no role for the government intervention, right? But if there are some dynamic complementarities, uh, such behavioral uh, dimensions of private action, uh, the risk of coordination failure, et cetera, then government uh, can create some, uh, some effects in the economy, some initial uh, redistribution stuff or information coordination or uh, some, uh, you know, simultaneous subsidies and tax schemes, all of these could, uh, if, if targeted well, all of these uh, would help the government uh, to move the economy to a better equilibrium. Uh, one other issue is the issue of history versus expectations, okay? Uh, because there are, uh, we are not discussing them right now, but there are different types of models with multiple equilibria, all right? In some models, uh, history is the only determinant of uh, equilibrium outcomes, okay? In those models, expectations play no role, all right? Uh, the initial point matters. If initially, uh, remember this, if initially uh, you are here, Remember, this is the threshold, right? This one is the threshold. So initially, if you are here, right? 
initially, if you are here, you always converge to the uh, low equilibria. Okay. Here, initially, if you are here, you always converge to high equilibria. So in this model, for instance, in this example, history determines where to converge. History in the sense that your initial point, right? Your initial uh, location. Uh, again, if you are here, for instance, if you are larger than the threshold, you again converge to high equilibria. If you are lower than the threshold, you converge to low equilibria. But in some other models, expectations play a role. Okay? And sometimes expectations dominate the role of history. Okay? So here, history tells you that Right? If you are here, if you are between D2 and D3, history tells you that you're going to converge to D3, right? But there could be some shifts in this function, right? Because this is basically privately hold. Uh, uh, this depends on the location of this, depends on how you uh, take your decision concerning the location of the average. If that expectation changes, if that type of private decision making is distorted in a positive way, all right, then the role of uh, history would be dominated by expectations. Okay. So there's a very nice paper by um, Paul Krugman. That's the title of the paper itself. So you can you can check check that paper. Okay, here's the here's the paper. So uh, uh, you can of course look also other other papers uh, written by other economists. So some concepts are relevant here. One is uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. Türkçesiyle kendi kendini gerçekleştiren kehanet. This is a situation where. Uh, as long as you believe something will happen, the mechanism is connected with your expectations. So that thing actually happens, all right? Uh, in such cases, we sometimes uh, categorize some of the variables as jump variables because those expectations will jump instantly, right? Right now, I believe that Turkey uh, will grow, let's say, 5%. This is an expectation. One second later, my expectation could jump to 4%, uh, 8%, OK? Because this is a jump variable. Another important concept is perfect foresight equilibrium. In the perfect foresight equilibrium, my expectation will be equal to the reality. Okay, my expectation will be exactly equal to the actual level. Uh, in the models where history is dominant, uh, we sometimes say history matters. Okay, history matters for which equilibrium you're going to converge. Okay, and in some models, there is indeterminacy, right? So, <coughs> sorry. In the case of indeterminacy, uh, there could be many different equilibrium paths, okay? And as the modeler, we don't know how to find these. We know that there are many, uh, but there's no way we can locate one of them as the equilibria, okay? All of these are equilibrium paths, but the model itself cannot determine which one will prevail. All right, this is in general called indeterminacy and models with expectations and all these different structural features, uh, we sometimes face the issue of indeterminacy. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop here. And now in the remaining three and a half minutes, I can answer your questions. So obviously this lecture is for um, create, I mean, 
and establishing some foundations for the next couple of weeks where we discuss some contemporary or modern theories that uh, basically benefit from such ideas. Okay, the floor is yours. I expect your questions. Uh, I have a question about the model with the expectations. Um, let me just quickly share. Okay, you go ahead. Well, the firm I and the other firms make their decisions simultaneously, or is there any difference between them in terms of time dimension? No, simultaneously, simultaneously. Each firm looks at the average. Of course, I mean, average itself is a concept, right? I mean, average itself should be somehow recorded. Uh, in such models, there is a time dimension, obviously, right? Because I invest, then I look at the average again, right? Then I update my decisions. So, so uh, you may put subscript T to all these variables, okay? So basically their expectations just realize. Exactly, yes. As you they see average here, out. Yes, as you see okay. here, X, X is the average of Ys, right? So imagine there are 10,000 firms, each investing, these investment levels are YI, so I take the expected value of these YIs, basically sample average, that sample average must be equal to X. Okay, okay thank you. It was a nice question. Thank you for the clarification. Any others? Okay, then I'm going to put some readings uh, for this week as well. Um, next week, let me let me just very quickly tell you what's what's the thing that we're going to do. So next week, uh, we're going to look at section 4.3, big push. Okay, there is this model of big push. This is a very nice idea developed in the 40s and 50s, and then uh, some economists uh, wrote down models, economic models for that. So next week, uh, we're gonna look at the big push models. All right then, uh, I will see you next week. Take good care of yourselves. Uh, good luck on your exams, okay? Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye.